Hello and welcome to another Arscast Extra, as always, with James from Gunner Blog. James, good morning to you. Good morning, Andrew. How are you doing? I'm tired. I'm tired. Yes? Yeah, I didn't sleep well last night. One of those nights where I just didn't sleep well. And when I did sleep, I was having very strange dreams about feeding Clint Eastwood carrots. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Was what, was, what was Clint Eastwood doing? He was sitting next to me at a dinner table. And, and he would, you were just feeding him like Bugs Bunny style, like raw carrots? When I, he would look at my plate and he'd go, I want a carrot. And I'd give him a carrot and everyone at the table would get really giddy and applaud. And he, he, he thought this was great. So he would eat his carrot and then go, give me a carrot. <laughs> and I'd have to give him another carrot. Were you hand feeding him? Yes. Wow. And they were like round carrots. You know the way you can chop carrots into their their round bits? Or you could do, what what do you call them, batons? Is that the shape? So they were like little carrot discs. Yeah, exactly. Sort of the natural shape of a carrot when you peel it and then just cut it into into discs, you know, rather than the sort of fancy posh way you might get in a... Sure. Uh, discs, not sticks. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And he was just, you know, like, like popping coins in a vending machine. Correct. He was just... Taking carrot after carrot. Exactly. And everyone thought this was great. Like, you know this. It was exactly like when you do something for uh, a child, a toddler, and they find it hilarious, even though it's not that funny, you know? Mm. You know that thing where everybody just had the, oh, look, he's giving him another carrot. Ah! So I had to just keep giving him carrots. It was <laughs> and quite And you felt tough. a bit uncomfortable. There came a point, yes, where I, I thought, well, this is Clint Eastwood. What's going on here? The guy can feed himself his own carrots if Absolutely. needs be. Absolutely. So, uh, wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a good dream, though. It's not bad. How are you? All good with you? Uh, Racking my brains, thinking if anything's happened in my subconscious to rival that. Not particularly. All right. good. It's weird. You know, when Arsenal are going well and there's an international break, I find I miss them desperately. Uh, and when they've lost a couple of games, <laughs> and then there's an international <laughs> break. I quite enjoy the respite. Yeah. Yeah. Have you missed Arsenal? Because it has been really quiet. We know they're in Dubai. They're doing their warm weather training and jumping up and down and things. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I have to say I've kind of, I think I was as ready for the break as the team were. Sure. Sure. It's just a shame we weren't invited along uh, to know. partake in the warm weather and the sliced meat but uh alas <laughs> yeah I, I was ready for the break as well i saw a lot of people um up in arms about the uh, the whole meat thing you know yes well there was a a telegraph column uh i think you know saying uh, how awful it was that michael Arteta ate some of the meat um and that has prompted its own backlash so there's been a backlash to the backlash i mean one of our Discord uh, members posted the video on on Reddit, from which I think the you know everything sparked off. And he he said he found it very strange the reaction uh, you know to to this video. I haven't paid a great deal of attention because if there's one thing you know I, I care less about than uh, online drama, it's online drama involving that sprinkly salt meat wanker, you know. Um, yeah, if you're not aware, I, I think there probably might be, there could be people listening who are not aware. But while in Dubai, Mikel Arteta, and I believe his family, um, went to the restaurant owned by Salt Bay, who, if I'm correct, is essentially uh, a Kurdish meat salesman um, and who's made, managed to make a career by cutting meat up and sprinkling salt on it in an extravagant fashion. Yes. Yeah. It's quite an achievement, to be honest. It's sort of like an incredible tale for our times. It's sort of the emperor's new clothes, really. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you kind of have to respect the The, the grind, the hustle. Yeah, yeah. Is it, it's just complete bullshit, isn't it? It's all, <laughs> yeah. it's all style and no substance, which is why I, I found it quite strange that people were getting mad at Mikel Arteta for, for engaging with this. I mean, is it not possible that this is just something that his kids wanted to do and he went along and you know was a good dad if there's anybody in this world that you think Mikel Arteta would not have any time for it's the sprinkly salt meat wanker because like <laughs> yeah. there's nothing to him beyond wearing a glove slicking his hair hair back and using a cutlass to cut up some steak and then sprinkling some salt on it like any cunt could do that you know <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean yeah I mean that is a fair summation of uh, of his art 
But yeah, I don't know what brought him there. I mean, listen, Mikel Arteta won't have been alone among that travelling party from Arsenal. I think a number of other players uh, have also partaken of the Sprinkly Salt Man's uh, fare <laughs> during the, during this break. But uh, yeah, I, I do find it interesting, the, the reaction that it provoked. I, th- I find it interesting more broadly that Mikel Arteta seems to have become quite unpopular. Uh, I think if we sort of step out of our Arsenal ecosphere, I think that he has become quite disliked and I'm interested by that. I'm interested by it. Do you mean by by opposition fans? Yeah, I I just mean by, I guess, the neutral or in an Arsenal perspective and opposition fans, obviously, or rival fans particularly. I mean, Um, I'm not saying he's the same as Jurgen Klopp, but are there shades of Jurgen Klopp in that, like, if he's your guy... You know, he's kind of easy to get behind, whereas if he's not, all the things that he does um, seem very, very annoying. You know, I quite like Jurgen Klopp in general, but I can understand why some people, you know, just would be irritated by him and his all his teeth and things, you know? Mm. Yeah, I also like Klopp, so it's a difficult one for me to answer. I think Klopp... <sighs> I feel like Klopp has waded slightly more into sort of social issues, particularly those connected to Liverpool and that city and Hillsborough and things like that. And I think that's earned him a lot of credit with football fans generally, like the way he's spoken about some of those things. Whereas Arteta, Mm -hmm. I think, steers clear maybe a little bit more. He's much more, he's less expressive on wider issues, very sort of focused on the here and now, the football. Mm. Um, so maybe he doesn't have the same sort of kind of cultural reach that a figure like Klopp does. I don't know. I, I might be wrong. I just, I'm intrigued how since he came into the club, I remember him sort of being initially quite popular and everyone being very impressed with him and liking him. But I do get the sense now when I speak to people who aren't Arsenal fans or speak to people who don't cover Arsenal that he has become quite disliked. Uh, mm. Yeah. That's, uh, but And I think that's what is behind the reaction to this um, meat-eating fiasco. It's actually yeah. nothing really to do with anything except the fact that people don't really like Mikel Arteta for whatever reason. Maybe. I mean, look, he he's not the warmest. You know, there are moments where I think he can be quite funny and stuff in press conferences, but I think there is a a public persona, maybe a private persona that, that might be slightly at odds. But, you know, from what we used to hear when he was a player at Arsenal – you know, he wasn't always the most popular um, figure sure. around because, you know, I think there is a, a sort of unbending strictness to his craft or his his what to, his discipline, you know, the, the game of football, how you train. I think that is, I think that's just part of who he is. And yeah. it's difficult maybe for, for people to connect to. Um, I should just he doesn't give a, do the warm, fuzzy stuff, no, really. He, he doesn't. doesn't do all the, mate stuff you know that people so love oh my no he doesn't um and i should just give a shout to joros who's our discord member who said uh, on our discord i was the one who originally posted the salt bay video on reddit and i'm fairly certain that everyone posting it is because of me and i'm deeply regretful i just thought it was funny people are fucking mad about it i'm off the internet for a while this is weird man so Mm. Mm. chill yeah it's all good it is weird and Listen, I'd be interested to see what other people think, you know, what listeners think. Maybe I'm wrong, but I just have this feeling, maybe it's because of sort of, you know, his touchline behaviour being pointed out or because of, you know, treatment and dialogue that he's had with officials and referees. Um, I have this sense that kind of the tide of the broader public opinion is is not with Mikel Arteta. Maybe. He's just not as well liked as certain other managers and it means people are out to get him maybe so but i mean i think there's also an element of how things are reported like remember a couple of weeks ago it was all arsenal have complained to pgmol about bakayo saka being kicked yeah yeah yeah. and it was not really the case it was something that came up in a routine meeting with pgmol that they have with all the clubs and all the managers and this is something that arsenal raised, you know, brought to their attention. They didn't Many make a big deal. Before. Yeah, exactly. You know, but this is being reported in the media and I think it's easy for perhaps a little bit of confirmation bias. Like I, get, I can get how people, particularly non-Arsenal fans, would find it very difficult to warm to Mikel Arteta and, and some of 
his behaviors, which, you know, I don't think are any worse than Klopp or Guardiola or, or many mm. managers who are passionate and committed and desperate to win and behave a certain way on the sideline. I don't think he's any different to them, but maybe they just have a bit more grace or success perhaps under their belts, which might be a sort of cushioning factor. I think success is part of it, actually. I, I should have mentioned that when talking about Klopp, but I think that that garners kind of a base level of respect that Mikel Arteta maybe hasn't quite won mm. from from the wider football populace. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know anyone who thinks or makes the point anymore that he's not a good coach. I think everybody thinks he is a good coach, and I think everybody respects him on that front. But yeah, I just think. In terms of popularity, um, he's got a little bit of a way to go. But then I sort of think he doesn't seem at all no. motivated by that. I don't know? think, and I don't think fuck, it's something he's going to chase after. No, 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 no. Not not interested in popularity contests, interested in winning football matches. And yeah. you know that comes with its own kind of coldness. But it is interesting for sure, I think. Um, you know, the, the well, if, yeah, I mean, listen, and also I, I think – it's interesting, but also is it important maybe to kind of foster that a little bit, maybe not with people outside Arsenal, but within Arsenal? You know, I I, I am struck sometimes by, say Arsenal have lost a, a couple of games as they have right now. Mm. I know it's the nature of the internet and things like that, but it does feel like for certain fans, they, their, their opinions can turn and spin so quickly. And I wonder if kind of fostering that, fuzzy, cuddly side might insulate you against those swings in opinion a little bit? Um, mm, maybe, maybe. Don't know. I don't know either. I think I think the people who have their minds made up about a person say very little when that person is doing well, but as soon as right. something goes wrong, this is all, all the evidence the they surface. need. Yeah, exactly. So you can't ever really turn it around. I think that, you know, there are people out there who might hold one opinion and can be swayed and changed. And, you know, I think that's to the credit of those people. Like we can all think something and then down the line say, you know what? I was wrong about that. You know, mm. My position has changed based on the evidence in front of me. But there are people who are unshakingly committed to one worldview or point of view, whether it's about Mikel Arteta or anything else. You know, I think sure. that's just in the nature of, of those people. Statement. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. I got that tattoo and I can't change my mind now. Yeah. Uh, I've got that tattoo of Arteta's face in clown makeup. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a hell of a lot of work to cover it. Um, and it's also my Twitter profile picture. So yeah, I'd rather stick with it if I can. <laughs> How are you feeling more broadly about Arsenal? Have, have you gained some perspective over this past week or so perspective there's a good question i don't know if it if i needed perspective i think i can rationalize a period in the season when things don't go particularly well mm. uh, i agree with you i wasn't challenging you on that. no no i know <laughs> i know i was like have you finally gained a bit of perspective andrew <laughs> um I, like I said, I think I've been I've welcomed the break because it has given me a chance to just step away a little bit from, um, you know, from the the day to day. Even though I'm doing all the day to day and with the blog and all the rest of it, you know, there is without the football, you can you can see how this break is going to be beneficial for the players. I mean, we saw a bit of training out in Dubai. Um, there are potentially some players coming back relatively soon from injury, which might be useful for us. And yeah, I, I, I just think that they, they, they hit a bit of a wall, you know, mm -hmm. and this is a good way to unsplatter yourself from the wall and uh, get going again. It did feel like that. I think from a physical and a psychological perspective, mm. you know, especially when you talk about kind of the travails in front of goal, you know, that felt like it had a, a psychological component to it. And maybe that is tied to the physical, you know, maybe when you are fatigued, when you are weary, that extra bit of sharpness that you need in the final third, maybe isn't quite there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, hopefully this can be a reset point. I was fascinated by some of the training images and videos. I think you pointed out this out in one of your blogs, but Ethan, Ethan Nyaneri and uh, Miles Lewis Skelly were, were training in headphones. 
Well, they were right. making their way to wherever they were going wearing headphones and nobody else was. I thought that was, I don't know why it's interesting or is it interesting or maybe it's just, you know, two young guys who who need to insulate themselves a little bit from the, from the grownups, if you want to call them that. I don't know, but I, I, sure. didn't, I did notice that. They were the only yeah. two, yeah. I thought it was curious. Hypnosis, probably. Just Mikel Arteta's uh, soothing voice, kind of um, <laughs> reciting tactical instructions to them uh, to fully ingratiate them in the football model. Um, yeah, I mean, the, it's not a great deal to say about the training. I mean, uh, well, I suppose uh, Thomas Partey is out there, isn't he? And Jurian Timber as well. Well, Jurian Timber back on the grass, which is mm -hmm. uh, a good step forward for him. So, um, you know, that's a that's a positive development obviously i think he's still got a little bit of a way to go before he he gets back uh, into contention for first team football but it is a positive thing to see him out there and integrated with the group and and hopefully um not too far away from making a return do you have any sort of uh hope or expectation for when that might be i mean there were some rumors and then they i think they were a little more than that pre-christmas about you know he could be back within a few weeks, could be back within a few months. Like, where are your own expectations for Timber? Like, do you think you'll see him play this season? Mm, I mean, I'm thinking maybe March might be the time where we see him, you know, mm. because the injury was in August. So if he makes it back by March, that's more or less the the normal time frame for an ACL Um I mean, I don't imagine seeing him anytime really soon, but I hope that we can see him again this season. The, the question is, of course, is like, what do we see this season? Do we see a guy who is making his way back slowly from a big injury and might be a bit rusty? Or do we see a guy who's got really fresh legs for the, for the end of the season? The second would be much more uh, useful for us, but, you know, these things are hard to... Hard to quantify, aren't they, when yeah. when someone's coming back from that kind of an injury? Well, he'd be a pretty handy player to have during the run-in, that's for sure. March, mid-March coincides with the return of the Champions League. Mm. Um, knockout stages. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I think that would be a really good outcome, to be honest. If he's back and taking some part in first-team action in March, I think he's done pretty well. Um, given that when it happened, you know, I initially thought, well... The season's a write-off for him. You know? Yeah. Um, but I'm sure Arsenal will want to be cautious. You know, the last thing they'd want is another setback to lose him for even longer and maybe even the start of next season. But yeah, if we can get him back March, April time, it could be really, really important. Yeah. Um, especially when you think about how we handled that time of year last season and some of the defensive issues we had to have him in the group would be brilliant. For sure. Um, what about uh, the boys who are away on international duty? Yeah, Mohamed El Nani played for Egypt in the uh, the African Cup of Nations. They needed a very very late penalty, didn't they, from Mo Salah to get um, to get a draw, a draw. with Mozambique? Mm. Some interesting yeah. results in this one as well. They have been, yeah. And what about Tomiyasu? He didn't play, right? He didn't play, and he wasn't even in the the squad i think i saw somewhere might have been on the the reddit uh, gunners reddit where there's a 26 man squad but you can only name 23 in your match day squad right so whether it's a case that he's not quite match fit yet or whether he's had some kind of a setback i don't know slightly concerned about it to be honest but you know that's based on zero information so i don't know and to be fair to japan you know, I think they have generally handled his injuries pretty sensitively. I mean, I remember during the World Cup, for example, you know, they took their time bringing him back into the starting eleven. Uh, it wasn't like they threw him in there straight away. Yeah. I think he initially began on the bench, made sub, sub appearances and worked his way in. So they have got a bit of depth defensively. I know he's obviously one of their best players, but if they might be looking at it and saying, well, we may need him later in the tournament. Mm -hmm. um, obviously... All of us who aren't Japan fans hope they don't need him late in the tournament because they're out and he's <laughs> safely home back with us. But uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we do see him out there because I, I think having been out for most of December and made played, what, 45 minutes was it against... Uh, Fulham. Against Fulham, yeah. I think he's going to need some game time if we're going to get him back kind of match ready. Mm. 
Well, I hope so. I hope he is um, just making his way back to to full fitness uh, because you know he is a a very good player when he is fit. But the questions over his fitness and his availability will continue uh, if he returns and and can't play for us for a little while. So uh, yeah. keeping fingers crossed what, on that. What about the transfer window, Andrew? I mean, oh, it's been it's so a- exciting. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, you know, we've had windows with relatively low expectations of Arsenal's involvement before, but I can't remember too many of that have been quite so quiet as this. Yeah. I wonder, is it because the games aren't there to kind of uh, affect the narrative? You know, we've not had another game where we've failed to take chances for sure. everyone to write a piece about how we need a striker. Or we've not had a game where, you know, we conceded a couple of goals and suddenly we need a defender. Yeah, it does feel like it's ever so quiet. And not to be fair, not just at Arsenal, but generally in the Premier League, pretty quiet. Yeah, Andrew Allen was telling me that um, in five of the last six years, January has been the busiest month on Arsblog News in terms of content and stories. And, you know, we were quite strict about what we do and don't cover when it comes to transfer stuff like it's not um it's not like you just post every single rumor we will maybe do a roundup but you know we don't go in for any of the the clickbait stuff so that will tell you how busy january usually is in comparison to to this january but yeah you're right it's very quiet there doesn't seem to be much happening um in many places who's done what did Tottenham signed someone, didn't they? Are they? Spurs signed a couple of players. They got Timo Werner on loan. Oh yeah, he, um, he was very good yesterday, wasn't he? Yeah, <laughs> uh, two two very bad games in the Premier League yesterday. Yeah, um, and they also signed, I think, a Romanian centre half um, who that, you know seems to be quite well regarded. <clears throat> Radu Dragasin is his name. Thirty-one million euros. Signing from Genoa in Serie A, uh, Bayern Munich were very much in for him as well. And Bayern Munich ended up with Eric Dyer, so yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> I think they got the rough end of that deal. Uh, kind of, who, however bad or good Dragazin turns out to be. So Spurs have been busy, but they have a pretty small squad, uh, and I think the Premier League team had used the least players or something like that, uh, right? made the least changes to their starting eleven in the first half of the season. So they needed to add a couple. But other than that... Yeah, I'm just looking at the Sky Sports. They have Arsenal in, none out, none. Um, Brentford, no, I mean, none. since we last spoke, there was a rumour about a um, uh, Spanish forward. Um, Borja Mayoral. Yes, who's flying high with uh, that club. Hatafe, uh, is it? Yeah, Hatafe, I think so. Um, uh, but that, yeah, we understand that's not really something that's serious or progressing. Um, <clears throat> what about uh, Amadou or Nana? Well, yeah, I mean, that story seemed to have some quite reputable sourcing, but my information is nothing happening there either. Um, could could anything change? Do you think with um, the latest developments when it comes to Everton and also Nottingham Forest? Uh, David Ornstein reporting for little known outlet The Athletic. Don't know if you heard mm-hmm. of them. He said um, Everton and Nottingham Forest expecting to be informed on Monday. They've been found in breach of Premier League profitability and sustainability uh, sustainability rules for a three-year cycle to June 2023. Both have prepared mitigation and will launch robust defences. I mean, there might be something um, in that. I don't know. We'll have to wait and see what the details are. But my the the charge that Everton eventually got penalised for was a long time between that charge actually being levelled at the club and then the punishment being handed out. So it doesn't seem like, you know, they're going to go, well, here's your charge, and now by the end of the month we're going to, you know, hit you with points deductions or whatever. So it's going to take a, some there time. There is a deadline on it. I think it's something like May the 29th. Um, so it, it, it should apply to this season for both clubs. Now... Would the sale of Anana help them? Not with regards to this charge because yeah. it's for a previous accounting period, right? The one that uh, takes in last season. And actually that's sort of one of the 
points of contention for Nottingham Forest because they sold Brandon Johnson to kind of, you know, help their FFP situation, but they did it too late for the deadline. Therefore, um, they are going to be charged today. They should just blame Spurs then. Yeah, Spurs didn't pay up in time, basically, yeah. was the problem they had. Um, and that's, you know, that's why Chelsea had to offload players in such a hurry last summer. And that's why we got Kai Havertz for such a, a bargain price, Andrew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a knockdown fee of just £65 million. Pounds. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, so the Inanna situation, I don't think, is, is tied to that particularly. Look, he's obviously a really good player. And I don't think Arsenal would be alone in in looking at him and, casting some admiring glances in that direction. He's really kicked on, uh, particularly over the last 12 months or so. I'd be quite surprised if he ends the summer at Everton. Mm -hmm. Um, But I I don't see them letting him go in January, especially if they end up having another points deduction to fight. I mean, as decent as their form has been, two points deductions in the same season uh, will make it pretty difficult for them. I mean, almost certainly put them in a a relegation fight of some description. Sure. Sure, but interesting to see how that all plays out. We'll wait and see at some point today. I presume the Premier League will announce that via their via their website, yeah. and everyone will go. But what about Man City and the hundred and fifteen charges? And life will just go on. <laughs> yeah, it, it is sort of problematic, isn't it? I know they're very different charges, yeah. very different uh, situations, but it does seem absurd. You know, as I said there's kind of a deadline on these Everton and Forest cases of the end of the season. It's actually a week after the end of the season. So you could get a situation theoretically where the season ends and those two clubs don't yet know their league position. Oh, that can't be right. I'm sorry. No. That that can't be right. There must be a way of, of dealing with that. I mean, it's a deadline. It doesn't mean that that is exactly. precisely when that's going to happen, I suppose. Hopefully they don't treat it like clubs do transfer deadlines and be like, well, we'll do it at 11.59. Um, mm. Yeah. So, yeah, hopefully it's well sorted by them because I think that is kind of unfair to have a table and then mess with it after the last ball is kicked. But the City thing, it does hang over everything a yeah. little bit. And I, I do think, yeah, I understand it's very complicated and there's armies of lawyers involved uh, in probably drawing it out as far as they can and making it as protracted and as difficult as possible. Twenty thirty seven. Even once, even once a punishment is set, you know, that will be appealed ad infinitum. So it, it's, it's going to drag on mm. and on, but it, it does seem odd. Hmm. We are 15 days into January. It is very quiet from a transfer perspective. Do you you have any... Faith is the wrong word, but I mean, do you have any expectation that things might change? Arsenal always say they are open to an opportunity in the market, which I think is, is fair. Are there potentially opportunities in the market for Arsenal? Does it necessitate moving somebody on um is that maybe more uh, more hassle than it might be worth depending on who you who's out there what do you think well it's interesting you know we spoke about it being a quiet january generally and you do wonder how much some of these profit and sustainability rules uh influence clubs thinking you know Mm. now they're seeing charges and punishments meted out relatively swiftly um, maybe that will be prominent in a lot of clubs' thoughts. And I think it will feature in Arsenal's thoughts, given the amount of money they spent last summer, given uh, how much they recouped or rather didn't recoup on a certain number of players. Um, I'm not particularly optimistic right now of Arsenal making a significant signing in this window. I think it absolutely could happen. You're right to say they're opportunistic and... Who knows, there might be a necessity. You know, you could lose a player to injury once we return to action towards the end of the month um, and it could necessitate something. But right now, Mm. it doesn't feel especially likely. What about you? I don't don't think so. I'm not expecting anything. It would be nice to get a surprise, but I think it's been so quiet. It's very difficult to operate in the transfer market and and to put out feelers without somebody finding out in this day and age, you know? Mm. It's really difficult to fly under the radar. Really, really difficult. So the the fact that nothing is being publicly um, 
or nothing is out there publicly. It makes me think that more than likely nothing is going on. We did have a question, though. I thought this was quite interesting from Alexander Nielsen. He's at Nielsen Alexander on Twitter. He said, is the lack of business in general this January window uh, so far and the very few sackings of managers in the Premier League, a product of clubs that are extremely cautious about uh, FFP uh, and are not used to or not pushing the button uh, like we're used to them doing. I think that's quite interesting, you know, based on what we were just talking about, that, you know, there are financial aspects to sacking managers as well. Yeah, I hadn't considered that, but that that is a fair point. Um, I, I do think that clubs are treading a bit more carefully than they might have been previously. I mean, Forrest and Everton are the two that we understand are going to be charged today. But I think there were at least half a dozen clubs who, you know, were close, were close to some of those markers. Uh, And that obviously will affect the way the business works. So, yeah, that could be a factor. Um, It is quiet. It is quiet, and I think the, the break as well, as I said, is part of that. You know, games determine narrative, and we've been without that. But um, it can hot up towards the final week or so, so mm. we shall see. And in fairness to Arsenal, you know, last January they signed Jakub Kivior, and that really did go under the radar. You know, I think the time between their interest being made public in the press and him actually being an Arsenal player was pretty brief. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't a name that was on anybody's radar prior to that. So we've got to give them some credit. They they do, you know, find a way to kind of do some of these deals with an element of espionage there. Mm. Who knows? Maybe there's something happening in the background that we're not aware of. Declan Rice turned 25. Is it now time to get rid of this old bastard? Cash in, I would say. Yeah. You know what they say about Rice, Andrew? You can't leave it out. It goes bad quickly. Is that what they say? Do they say that? I think, no, don't reheat it. Or if you're reheating it, make sure it's heated all the way through. I mean, isn't fried rice rice that is reheated? Don't you cook the rice first and then refrigerate it and then cook it as fried rice? Yeah, but you better heat it all the way through. I mean, they're and tiny. that's what I'm saying about Declan rice. Oh, but they're, they're very small. Rice are tiny. It's How do you not heat rice all the way through? You're right. I don't know why I've got this in my head, but I, I, I think rice is sort of known to be a bit of a breeding ground for bacteria. Maybe it's because they've got very high surface area because there's lots of them. Lots. I don't know. What's what that? I'm saying is, and I'm not saying Declan rice is a breeding ground for bacteria. Right. Who knows? What are you saying, though? Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I like that uh, Mitch Happy Hedberg. Birthday, Declan. Mitch Hedberg um, gag about rice. So rice is what great is if you're really hungry and you want to eat thousands of something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, if only we had thousands of our beloved Declan. Thousands of Declan rices. Uh, I'm not uh, sure. He's 25. We okay. Yeah. Well, the, the peak, the prime is upon us, I mm. guess. Uh, we should relish uh, what we're about to see. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, what else, Andrew? What else? I don't know. Maybe we should do some questions. Maybe we'll do a question or two in this half of the show and a question or three or four in the in the second half of the show. Okay. Should we do some questions? Let's, that seems like a very good idea. Here's one. So Cal Ben. These are, you know, uh, funny questions. Good morning, Arse team. Time to choose a striker for a six-month loan. The player comes as they currently play, and you must choose one of the following. Olivier Giroud, Danny Welbeck, Alexandra Lacazette, or Aubameyang. Which one gets your vote? Six-month loan. Um, I guess the correct answer. Who is it? Giroud, Aubameyang, Lacazette, and Welbeck. Yeah. Um... I think I would go... How's Oba doing at Marseille? Um, Good question. I don't know. Let's have a look. He's doing better than Nicolas Pepe is doing at um, wherever the hell he is. Fenerbahce? Is he at Fenerbahce now? He's in Turkey, I believe. Uh, He's got five goals in five Europa League appearances. Trabs on Spore, sorry. That's all right. And... Five goals in 15 league starts. So he's got 
uh, and a couple of goals in Champions League qualifiers. So he's overall he's got 12 goals from 25 appearances for Marseille. One in two. Right. I guess he is the ans- my answer. Right. I, w- I would go Giroud. Would you go Giroud? Yeah. For me, it's between those two. It would just be something a little bit different, you know? Yeah. Something different in terms of, like, what can you do in the last 20 minutes of a game where you're chasing a goal? Stick Giroud up there, lashing some crosses. He's got 11 goals and seven assists in 23 games. You've talked me season. around. I think it is Giroud, you know. Mm. I was thinking over because of the, the goal-scoring um, issue, and I, I remember Olivier Giroud, to be fair, and Aubameyang, both missing plenty of chances yeah. in their time with Arsenal. Sure. But I think Giroud has improved, maybe, in that respect. I think with age and his great maturity um, and beauty has come a kind of finesse in front of goal. And he does provide a different profile of attacker. Aerial threat. Aerial threat. He'd give us that. Uh, we had a couple of questions like this. Uh, Simon on Twitter, who's SH. S. Harrington says, what's up with Arsenal Twitter's weird nostalgia and longing for a recent past (laughs) where players who were never good enough and we all hated at the time should be brought back? And on the Discord, Stan, but not that one, says, recently I saw a compilation video on Twitter of Lacazette scoring goals for Arsenal, accompanied by a tweet questioning, apparently unironically, if Gabriel Jesus is actually better than our old number nine. Needless to say, that's insane. It follows an equally absurd tweet featuring a Pepe compilation video I saw during the rounds not long ago. It has me wondering, how low can we go if our current poor run of form continues? Will we see a tweet pining for Willian? A montage of Mustafi? My own prediction is that some unhinged account will claim Matteo Genduzzi would have made the perfect left eight, which is a bit harsh on Elliot, but I know where you're coming from. (laughs) Uh, yeah, I mean, I saw one that was about, uh, I think the caption was something like, maturity is realising that Ainsley Maitland-Niles is better than Ben White. And they followed a sort of <laughs> compilation of Ainsley Maitland-Niles. No way, really? Yeah. And not to sort of, you know, throw uh, Arsenal Vision too hard under the bus, but I basically blame Clive for the Ainsley Maitland-Niles love that's out there. Because <laughs> Why? What Clive, did do? Because Clive is so eloquent and convincing and intelligent and influential. And he loved Ainsley Maitland-Niles, right? Mm-hmm. And he, would, he would wax lyrical about his attributes and his qualities. Conversely, I've always felt that he was one of the most sort of vastly overrated players of Ars- at Arsenal in recent years. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and I feel like because Clive's, as I say, a convincing man, mm. I, I accuse him here publicly of fostering the cult of Ainsley Maitland-Niles. Well, you know what? Where I think he had a point was if if Ainsley Maitland-Niles had, had really grasped the opportunity that was available to him mm. when the right-back position was sort of all over the place, I think he could have been molded into a decent right back. But maybe. This, but you know, I'm not saying he would have been better than Ben White. I'm just saying that that this desire he had, I think he's kind of always f- uh, flitted around where he wants to play. Remember um some stories, I think we did a story on Arsenal News once where he's like, where do I see myself in five years playing right wing for Arsenal and scoring goals and things like that? And then, you know, he had the opportunity of right back. Then he wants to be a central midfielder. I'm just looking up his stats this season for Leon. Leon. He's, he hasn't really played very much. Eight appearances, just 356 minutes of league football so far. Um, I do no. think he missed an opportunity. Now, would he have been the right back at Arsenal for this current Arsenal? I don't think so. Could he be or have been a very serviceable right back for a lot of Premier League clubs? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. But I still think... Uh, I suppose what I would say is that a player's talent is not just their kind of... Well, talents. A player's ability, let's say, or a player's potential is not mm. defined by their talent, by their technical and physical attributes. It's also a lot to do with their mentality, you know, their 
um, ambition, their uh, the the sort of setup they have sure. around them, and I think there were a lot of things in that respect that made Ainsley's success at Arsenal quite improbable. Mm. Um, but listen, <laughs> I I. I wish him all the best. He's played, all his games for Leon have been in midfield, apparently. Yeah, that's right. Central midfield and attacking midfield, according yeah. to uh, Transfer Marked. So. Who knows? I mean, he's now 26. Uh, he'll be 27 later this year. It could still happen for him, but I just feel like I just feel like it's not going to. Anyway, the broader point, now that we've thrown Elliot and Clive under the bus yeah. at last... Overdue, uh, Jesus. Long overdue. They, they need to bring it down a peg or two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> is that um, I don't know where this mad nostalgia comes from. It's it's bonkers. I mean, is it because we've lost a couple of games? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think so. And also That's- you can make anyone look pretty great in a you know two-minute compilation. Um We've fallen victim to that ourselves before in the transfer market. Um, yeah, I would ask. I would ask anyone who um, is pining for Alexander Lacazette to go back and watch the game we lost against them at home. Was it two nil? Maybe Trossard scored, and I can't remember who scored the other goal. Oh, it was the guy who had to retire, wasn't it? Oh yeah, the Brighton game. You mean? Yeah, yeah the yeah, Brighton yeah. game. Go watch that game. And then come back to me and tell me how much you miss Alexander Lacazette, please. But in a beautiful act of hypocrisy, wouldn't we like Olivier Giroud back? Isn't he handsome? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) But we were forced into that choice. It wasn't something that we said, you know, we we, we actively wanted. We had to make a choice. We were, you know, the the, the question said we had to. So we had to. Mm, Yeah, no, I agree. And I I think, listen, in fairness to some of these players... It is hard to know, and I'll include Ainsley in this. Like, it's hard to judge players in certain contexts. You know, some of these guys were playing in Arsenal teams that were bad. Now, how much was their, that their fault? It's some really it. difficult to define. Some of it. <laughs> yeah, sure, about an 11th, you would imagine. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, that's the thing. Like, people say, oh, this guy was better, this guy was better. Well, with the guys we've got now, we are better. We are a lot better. Yeah. And where are that, those guys right now? Traps what are they doing? Spore. Yeah, exactly. Trabs on Spore. Man, uh, I was looking at that. I was, that whole Nicolas Pepe thing. Boy, oh boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of money. A lot of money. A lot of money. It, it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's fascinating to look back. And listen, players have times where they were better. I mean, Alex Lacazette was our player of the season one season, as I, as I recall. And Oba certainly had times where, you know, he was felt like he was carrying the club on his shoulders when we won mm. that FA Cup in 2020. It's not, I don't wish to remember players as they were at their worst, but I think you've got to try and take a broader perspective and yes. factor everything in. That's fair. That's fair. And I think that's probably a good place to leave part one. Um, and we'll do some more of your questions, of course, in, in part two. So let's take a break. We'll come back with your questions and more in part two right after this. Welcome back to the Arsecast Extra. This is part two of the show where we answer questions that you sent to us on Twitter at Gunnerblog and at Arsblog. Also on the Arsblog Discord chat server, which you get access to if you are an Arsblog member on Patreon. I enjoyed your piece with Thomas Rosicki today in The Athletic. What was it like going to Prague to meet him? Well, it was cool. I mean, I'd never been to Prague for a start, and it's obviously a beautiful city. Um, yeah, I went to see Sparta Prague play Real Betis in the Europa League. Mm. And I spent the afternoon with Thomas before that. And he was really great company, I have to say, like a very engaging, thoughtful guy. I spoke to a Czech journalist before I went out there and they said, just to warn you, sometimes you'll ask Thomas a question and he won't answer it for quite a long time. Like he'll sit in silence and think about it. And not many people <laughs> in football do that. And uh, he was absolutely right. That is what he does. Like if, if you ask him something, he won't just roll off a cliche. He will genuinely try and think about it and engage with it intellectually and give you a proper answer, um, hmm. which I massively appreciated. Right? I'd love to see footballers do that 
yeah. in post-match interviews. So how did you find the game today? Hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's a good job we weren't filming it, I guess, but <laughs> wouldn't make for great TV. But I, I think it's, it is, you're right. Like in post-match interviews, players, uh, you know, they're quite rapid fire, aren't they? Like you've got to answer that question within a millisecond, mm-hmm. essentially. So no wonder sometimes the answers you get aren't particularly insightful. But I, I really had the impression that Rizitsky is someone who thinks very deeply about football and about his role. And there were two things. We talked about a lot of different things. Um, I could have done two pieces, to be honest. But there were two things he said in particular that really stayed with me. One was about speaking about his injuries. Um, and, you know, I, I asked him, like, sort of, do you think you were just unlucky? Where do you think it all comes from? And he spoke about starting out playing in the Czech league. I think he was about 17 when he broke into the first team and being this tiny playmaker, number 10, who basically was kicked all the time. And it got so bad eventually that his own dad said to him, look, you're going to have to leave. You're going to have to go and play elsewhere because otherwise they'll kill you here. I mean, he was getting kicked up in the air week after week. So he, he went to Dortmund and he hoped it would be better. And it wasn't. Um, he played <laughs> as number 10. And at that time in Germany, you know, man marking was the, the fad. And it just meant that basically a, a guy would follow him around um, and Boot him. kick him, mm. boot him. Yeah. Mm. And essentially he played through all this and he was fine. He didn't sustain major injuries, but his kind of personal theory is that though that those kickings, the cumulative impact of those mm. is what led to a lot of his problems later in his career. And I just thought it was really interesting. It feels quite pertinent, really, you know, when we talk about Bukai Saka uh, and some of the treatment he receives and his his we've spoken about his resilience and how he's able to get up and play on. And I know, you know, probably the Premier League is maybe not quite what the Czech league was in the late nineties when Thomas made his breakthrough in terms of the physicality that you mm. might receive. But it did make me think, you know, we may not know about some of the damage that's being done for some time. It may not be obvious on the surface. Yeah. It may be something that comes later. And, you know, Rosicki cited people like, Jack, uh, Aaron Ramsey, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, Theo Walcott, all guys he played with who started very young um, and paid a price for, for it eventually. Yeah, it's it's a tough one, isn't it? Because some of them, you know, it, it might be easy to draw a connecting line between them, but the context of each of them are, are quite different. Sure, you know? like, like Ramsey, for example. Yeah, so. Ramsey was basically assaulted. Wilshire, again, there were a couple of really bad tackles on him. Um, Theo did ACL, which can happen to, to lots of players. Um, but yeah, I, I guess if you're being booted around from a very early age, there will come a point where your body says, that's enough of that, thanks. I need a I need to yeah. sit down. But I remember the the Rosicki injury, the knee injury. I don't know how much detail he went into it with you, but there was something quite unfortunate about it in that when I think it initially happened, they did all the scans and everything looked relatively normal. Um uh, Yeah, he played he, 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 so it happened in one game against Newcastle in the FA Cup. And uh he felt it and uh, and he was deemed fit enough to start the next game. Yeah, well, well, I think they did the scans and everything looked normal. Whatever had happened, when whatever went wrong, it all just sat down in exactly the right place. Yeah. And and that made it very difficult for Arsenal to diagnose that uh, injury. It took them some time to get to the bottom of it, I think. Yeah, and he spent 18 months out, which is kind of Oof. crazy. But Too yeah, he was, it, it was interesting to talk about that. And also, I was just struck by him as... I have this sort of pet theory that, you know, Fergie, part of his legacy was like a generation of coaches, a lot of people who went into coaching and management who played under him. And uh, I have this hunch that with Arsene, he might kind of uh, have bred or initiated a, a load of sporting directors. Like there's a few around, there's Edu, there's Rzitski, Philip Senderos is doing that role. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark Overmars, although obviously you know, somewhat disgraced at this point in time, was doing that role. Um, 
and uh, you know my sort of my theory is that because Wenger was such a sporting director in the way he saw things, you know, he, he kind of over, had an overview of the whole club, the business side, mm. as well as the football side, that I think if you worked with him or under him or, or closer to him, Per Mertaka might be another example, you'll be interested in that kind of more yeah. technical director element. It'd be very interesting to go through the, 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 the players who played under Wenger and how many of them are are still in the game. You know, Colo yeah. Toure is a coach. There are a lot of, you know, players who are on the fringes, for example, who who are still in the game, some of them at Arsenal. Yeah. Um, there's Stephen Bradley, you know, who who was a very highly thought of uh, young Irish player who Liam Brady convinced to come to Arsenal, uh, fending off the advances of of Manchester United, among others. I don't think he ever made... Did he maybe make one appearance? I can't quite remember, but he's doing exceptionally well as the manager of, of Shamrock Rovers over mm. here. I think they've won four, maybe four um, titles in a row, League of Ireland titles in a row. So he's, wow. you know, very, very good um, young coach. He's still only 39. Uh, and I'd say across the, the catalogue of Wenger players, there must be a really high percentage of them who are still involved in the game. Now, that's not just down to Arsene Wenger. I think when you're involved in football, staying in football is an obvious thing to do because a lot of footballers don't really know what else to do. But mm. um, it's how many of them are you know, doing a good job and a successful job. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Rosicki, I think, always envisaged he would go into coaching. Um and he was offered to do that at Arsenal when he retired. Um, but he's ended up doing this kind of sporting director role. And mm. yeah, listen, I, I, I did ask him about his future and, you know, where does he see it going? Because Sparta Prague is obviously the club that he began at. It's the club he finished at. It's his club, right? And yeah. he took this on to kind of return them to glory. I think they've been pretty much a decade without winning the title, which for, for them is unthinkable. You know, historically, they're the most successful club in, in Czechoslovakia, in Czech Republic, rather, sorry. And um, I think he always just thought of it as like a one-hit thing. I'm going to do it at Sparta, and then who knows, maybe that's it for me. But it was interesting to hear him say, you know, as time has gone on and he's enjoyed it and he's attracted interest from elsewhere, he has considered, contemplated, you know, could he do the job? Would he do the job mm. elsewhere? Um we obviously have a, a sporting director in place at the moment in Edu, but I, I could speaking to Tomaszewski, I couldn't help but think, you know, at some point down the line, given his vision uh, for football, his intelligence, the clear, you know, uh, affinity for this role that he's had, he's taken on. You never know; could be an option, couldn't it, for him to come back? He is really, really, really loved here in London as well. Mm. I was struck by that, like when I said I'd interviewed him so many people just so happy to hear from him i think yeah a, a, a special player and yeah yeah I always, know. maybe in the future there could be a, a connection i always loved him as a player actually um do do you know anything did you ask him about his barbecuing skills because that is clearly the, uh, the litmus <laughs> test the for barometer yeah, yeah i didn't i didn't uh, and like i say i think it would be a long way off and and who knows he, he may decide that sparta's it for him but he's done a good job yeah. you know they They've won the league there. They lost their Champions League qualifier to Copenhagen, which, you know, on penalties, which on reflection doesn't look too bad. I mean, Copenhagen really acquitted themselves pretty well in the Champions League this year. Um, that's the big aim, to take Sparta back into the Champions League. So uh, once he's done that, uh, I don't know, he might feel nice. like job done. All right. Do you want to go with a question? Yeah, let's go with a question. Um I had loads here. Where are they? They've hidden from me now. Oh, that's a shame. <laughs> I did loads of prep, Andrew. I got them all lined up. I copied and pasted them into a little document. Where is now it? Now they've just disappeared. Um, here we go. What about this? Uh, Todd Sutton says, Goodly morning, gents. Who, if anyone, do you think will have a breakout second half of the season? And he said, presumably it will need to be someone for us to have any chance of winning something. Mm. I had that question too. I was going to ask you that one. Um, I mean, I look at the bench and I don't really see anyone on the bench. I mean, breakout is kind of specific in terms of the terminology. Probably means somebody who hasn't done it before. And I don't mm -hmm. think that there's anyone in the squad who would fit that bill, but like, if we can expand the question into like, who do I think 
could spark into life in the second half of the season, I'm going to go with Gabriel Martinelli. Because I know he's been a bit underwhelming this season. I know the goals haven't been there. The assists haven't been there. But I think he's capable. I really do think he's capable of of scoring more and delivering more. So if I had to pick somebody, I had to put like my life savings on a player doing something in the second half of the season that would be really beneficial for us, he would be my guy. That's a nice one. That is a nice one. Um, I'm going to go with... I think I've got to go with Gabriel Jesus. I think. I, I, listen, there will, it will be debated to what extent he has been alive uh, in the first half of the season. But if I look at his record in the Premier League in particular, 11 starts, four substitute appearances, mm. so 15 appearances all in all, three goals, one assist. I have to think that he can do much better than that. Yeah. Um, and I have to think as well that if we're going to do anything this season, he needs to do better than that. Yeah. So, and he's obviously got the talent. I think it really is a question of if he can stay consistently fit. Um, I think if he does, he's got a great chance to have a really strong second half of the campaign. Mm. So okay. I will go for Jesus. A pair of Gabriels. Well, listen, why not both? Is there any sort of dark horse contender for you and Emil Smith wrote a Fabio Vieira if anyone yeah. remembers I mean they Fabio would be Vieira. they would be the only two I think that could potentially fit that bill but it's about whether or not they get the minutes doesn't look like it's going to happen for for Smith Rowe certainly not at the moment Vieira still injured we don't quite know when when he's going to be back um has he been spotted in Dubai I think he is out there yeah I think he okay. is good good tiny good. little guy he's out there yeah <laughs> yeah, easy to fit on the plane. They've took, they actually put him in the overhead cabinet. Yeah. Uh, Please store your Fabios in the overhead compartment. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, they are the obvious. Marquinhos, obviously, now he's back from loan. Oh, yeah, he's going to tear it up. He's the guy to save our season, all right? That, why, yeah, like a new signing, Marquinhos. Um, Here's one. Let me ask you this one. We just mentioned on. him, but John Knott, who's at John Knott one, said... Would the outrage at us not signing any player, not on loan, be worse than the outrage at selling Emil Smith Rowe to fund a new signing? I think that people love new signings so much <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that if it meant selling Emil Smith Rowe and possibly like a lung, people would do it. You know, yeah. I, I I think that um, the excitement of the new generally outweighs uh, the kind of pain of of losing somebody. So I think that's a trade that many people would accept. Um, and I think as well, maybe there's an acceptance that if Emil Smith Rowe is not going to get the minutes, then why keep him around? Yeah. Yeah. I, I hate saying that, but like, I think it was sort of where we're at, isn't it? I think so, sadly, because I really like him and I think he's a very talented player, but whatever's happening um, can't be viewed as positive. I think you have to look at what a manager does much more than what a manager says. Absolutely. About a player to really get an understanding of, of what they think of him and what he can contribute and at the moment, it doesn't seem as if Mikel Arteta thinks Emil Smith Rowe can contribute very much. So that is a shame. So maybe the question, you know, is maybe we should get somebody else in who he he does have a little more faith in. Here's another one similar. Um, Matt, who's at Matty RSF1, he said, if you had a choice between either having a fully fit Thomas Partey available for the rest of the season or a new January signing coming in, which would you choose and why? In, in that position with the January signing? Well, thing. any position. Um, I mean, you've got to bear in mind we've got a clapped out ancient Declan Rice now, you know? Sure, yeah, exactly. Past is, is, is sell-by date. I think oh, that's a tricky one, you know? I mean, a fully fit Thomas Partey is a really good player. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we've I done all right without him. We have, yeah. 
assuming that we can make like an amazing signing, I think I would probably just edge towards that, and I I probably would add some an attacking player, yeah. uh, and and cross all my fingers that Declan Rice, um, in his old age, survives until the end of the season. Yeah, if we can get him through on his Zimmer frame. You know, yeah, exactly. Time. I mean, you know, you've got Jorginho. Um, Maradon Denny will be back eventually. <laughs> um, I think I uh, that that's the only reason that I would sort of love a player who could really add something to the front yeah. line. But listen, if, if you, either of those options, I think would leave Arsenal in a much stronger position. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Uh, I, I'm just not. I just I have so little faith in Partey's ability to stay fit at this point in time that. Mm-hmm. It feels kind of fantastical almost. Um, what about this from What's This Now? I enjoy that name. What's This Now? Oh, that is. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I thought you were startled by something. No, no, no. That's just the quality of my acting, Andrew, fooling you. Yeah. So um, What's This Now? Says <gasps> the mental aspect of the goal scoring issue might persist if we miss that first big chance against Palace. With that in mind, to which of our players do you want that first big opportunity to fall oh my god <laughs> i know that is a that's a difficult one isn't it it is yeah. a difficult one i guess like, you want it to be martinelli so that your yeah 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 so my breakthrough be proven true maybe i mean that's the thing is like who benefits the most from getting an early goal against palace if we get an early goal against palace yeah like which player who hasn't been able to find the target in recent weeks could um, could then kick on. But then there are so many to choose from. Odegaard has missed chances. Saka has missed chances. Jesus, Martinelli, Havertz. Who do I want it to fall to? Ben White. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Of course. Yeah. Ben White and then everyone can just sort of luxuriate in the bronzed thigh goodness that will permeate throughout the team when he scores the goal. Imagine it's like it's like the it's, color of Ben White when he gets home from Dubai. Amazing. You could be like David Dickinson from Bargain Hunt. <laughs> who's the guy? Who's the yeah, who's the actor? George Hamilton the third. Yeah. That guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He looks like a human cabinet. He's uh, just that exactly, dark. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Polished with wood polish. I yeah, I, I In serious I think note, I would say Martinelli. I think yeah, I would me say too. Me too. Uh, I just think he needs the monkey off his back, if that makes any sense. Mm. Anil says, uh, he's on Twitter, he's at Anil underscore Nijar. He says, pure hypothetical. Would you take a point at home to Liverpool and at the Etihad right now if offered? So point, I guess, in both of those games? Yeah. Yeah, I would. Mm. Would you? No. Okay. i take three points against Liverpool. Mm. and Kesara Asara at the Etihad because three points would be better than two two points for us but obviously there's implications for the other teams as well yeah there's the swing to consider mm. I, I think I think if you can come out of the season without losing a game to City and Liverpool and then it's like down to you and what you do against the other teams. Yeah. I, I think that's a pretty healthy position to be in. Um, so I think I would go for that. But it, it's, I had a question about City, by the way, from Speckled Jim, who said, is Kevin De Bruyne just taking the piss out of the league slash everyone with that new hairstyle? I um, haven't noticed his new hairstyle. Should I look it up? Well, yes. It, it, interestingly, City's kit has got like a kind of golden trim to it because they won the treble last year and i was really struck that his hair seemed to sort of perfectly match the gold on the kit um he's had six months or so however long he's been out to to hone that but he yeah i think he has got a new kind of it's a bit ice cr- grealishy is it it is a bit grealishy yeah maybe he it just is- loves jack and has watched him in training every day and thought i want a bit of that i can't i can't get my calves like that if I do, my hamstrings will explode forever. So I'll mm. just go with the hair. But can you see that the gold mm. badges really sync up beautifully? It's like they're working with the same color palette, essentially. 
I imagine his eyes probably perfectly match the blue of the shirt. Probably well. some marketing company is behind yeah. all this. You know. Quite depressing, though, to see him back and being Yeah, <laughs> Yeah. You know, they're very good without him, and then they're even better with him. I did think his goal against Newcastle was very soft, I have to say. Well, yeah. It's good. It really reminded me of a lot of goals he scored against us, to be honest. Mm. Like, just sort of marching through the midfield and, like, passing it into the bottom corner. I think that's where he feels like he's really taking the piss. Where he's like, "I don't actually even need to hit this very hard. Mm. I I can just aim it really accurately." I, I, every season, I go through a period where I forget he plays for them, and I start to get confident, and then he comes back. <laughs> <laughs> he is as relentless and inevitable as as Manchester City themselves. I think. Yeah, he's the perfect embodiment. I mean, that did you see that Newcastle game? Mm. I saw bits of it. I saw highlights. Yeah. Not I mean, great goals uh, in the first half. Three mm. brilliant, brilliant goals. And Newcastle found themselves ahead. But City were really on top the whole game and got their stoppage time winner. Yeah. So this is the start of the 19-game winning streak, yes. I imagine. Yeah. It's what happens every year. It doesn't matter what anyone else does. This is just mm. what happens. But that's what I'm saying. If we can get that point at the Etihad, at least we'll interrupt the winning streak. Mm. I think three points at the Etihad would be nicer for us. That's what I... Um, okay, yeah. hold out for that, by all means. You may be holding out for some time. I may indeed. I'm not holding uh, my breath. Don't sure, worry. no, don't. Uh, you shan't survive. Gibzinho, I, I thought this was interesting. Morning, gents. I may be asking this because I have too much free time on my hands. Well, don't we all, Gibzinho? But, but what is the job of the fourth official? We see managers barking into their ears on, on the sidelines... Do they have any impact on the game or on the referee's decisions? I I, th I can't think what they're for. Really. I said, I just Googled, what does the fourth official do? In yeah. general, fourth officials are responsible for assisting the referee with administrative functions before, during, and after the match. Yeah. Uh, assessment of players' equipment. You know, they've got to check their rings. <laughs> sure. Managing substitutions, including using the numbered board or electronic display where supplied. And then I think they just have to soak up, you know, Jurgen Klopp and Mikel Arteta screaming in their ears. Mm, yeah, I mean, they are pretty pointless. They are basically there as a kind of soundproofing device, like a kind of buffer mm. just to absorb the sound waves that come off Jurgen Klopp during the 90 minutes. Um yeah, I, I, they are pretty pointless. I'd say they're the person who's been sort of most uh, kind of had their balls chopped off by VAR. They're, I'd say they're now almost entirely redundant. Maybe so. Holding up a board. Well, we saw a bit of VAR yesterday, didn't we, in the, the Villa Everton game. We'll talk a bit I, more about VAR and stuff in, in the 30 a bit later oh good. on. Oh, good. Know. I'll tune into that for, for, for my VAR fix. Yeah. I, I see we have another one of the uh, player ratings games from Critical Team. Yeah, shall we play? Yeah, let's do that. Conventionally, I I, I read the, the clues and you guess, which yeah. I think is, is fun because you've written them. Yeah, and um, forgotten them immediately. And forgotten them, of course, <laughs> like everything you write. By the way, what an exclusive it was for Ask Blog to get uh, access to the players' diaries. Oh, yeah. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a moment. Congratulations. I mean, Thank you very much. Very took a lot of took a lot of work behind the scenes to uh, procure those rights, you know? I bet. Yeah, 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 yeah. The serialization. Okay, Critical T is delivered again okay. with the player rating game. With the mood in the fan base at a bit of a low, I think it's time for player ratings game. Last season special. Ooh, okay. To so remind us relatively of the good fresh. times. Let's do this, he says. Okay, rating number one. Two goals against, and then the opposition is redacted. Okay. What a fucking dude. And what a way to answer the people who felt you couldn't contribute. Two goals. Two goals last season. Um, but who he, felt he couldn't contribute or who did people feel couldn't contribute? I That's, think I know who it is. Is it, is it Martin Odegaard? Okay, I'm going to go with Eddie and Ketia. Oh, of course. Manchester United at home. It yes, was Eddie of course. and Ketia. Yes, that one should have been obvious. I'm an idiot. 
That's why this game's good listening. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Rating number two, 8.5 out of 10. It was a great ball from Shaka, but also a superb header bulleted into the top corner. Could have scored more, denied by the goalkeeper, and it was another all-round stormer from the Brazilian. Well, he's given that one away. It's Gabriel Jesus. I can't remember the the game. It's Brentford it? away, I think. Yeah. It is Gabriel Jesus. It is Brentford away. Get in. Do you remember that goal? Yeah, really yeah. Pass. Far top corner. Really good header. David Raya, presumably, in goal uh, that day. Mm -hmm. 8.5 out of 10. His experience is so valuable. That late bit on when he rattled opposition player was fantastic. That bit late on, rather. Mm. That bit late on when he rattled opposition player was fantastic. Jorginho? I can't remember. Was it Jorginho against Villa? Uh, I think if it was against Villa, you would have mentioned the goal. Mm. Going in off the back of Emi Martinez's Yeah, I think head. any opportunity to mention that. I'm going to say... It's Shaka or Jorginho is where it's, I go. I'd say it's going to be Jorginho, and I'll pick a random game. What's a game we want? Newcastle. I'll say Newcastle. Oh, yeah, maybe. The answer was Granite Shaka. And it was and Newcastle, was it? No, it was Chelsea away, 1-0. Oh, and actually, actually... Didn't he it rattle Jorginho that he it was Jorginho that he rattled? I remember ah, there was some. Yeah, there we go. Was that the one where he went on TV afterwards and and swore? Quite possibly. Right. I don't remember. I remember the goal. I remember Gabriel scored in that game. Right. Uh, seven and a half out of ten. I feel like he needs two ratings. He annoyed me in the first half, but in the second half, stepped up used the ball better and fired home a great equaliser. I know that one. Mm, I don't. He, I think that, that this is a player that you often feel a bit like you'd like to give him two ratings. Like, you know, there's good and bad in his performances at the same time. Right. I mean, I'm thinking Enkedia again. <laughs> it's not Enkedia. Um, I don't think. Hmm. No idea. I think it's going to be your friend of mine, Alexander Zinchenko. Ah, of course. He annoyed me in the first half, but stepped up in the second, used the ball yes, better. Yes, of course. And it was the Villa game. And it's where the he Villa scored. game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, okay. This one's tricky. <laughs> Nine out of ten. What a goal. And that's all we've got. What a goal. What a goal in caps. Bukayo no, Saka. Against? No idea. Man, Man U at home. Okay. Well, I got you that. Say, uh, no, that's wrong. Oh. <laughs> that was my guess. Okay. The answer is Jakub Kivior against, I guess it's Wolves on the final day of the season. <laughs> it was an ironic <laughs> what a goal, Andrew. You I should have known that. you don't go caps freely. Jakob you know I mean? Kivior scored against Wolves. I know I was there. I think he did. Didn't Tommy Asu score as well? No, Tommy Asu scored this season against Sheffield United. Oh, yeah. i just looking it up. Yeah, Jakob Kivior scored in the 78th minute. I've got no recollection whatsoever you of Kivior scoring. You might have a couple of that. pints by then. Potentially. Should we have a look at it, the goal? Uh, I'm yeah. going to have a quick look. Kivior Wolves. It's goal. a call. Oh. Oh. Are you there? I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It just went weird there for a second. Oh, really? Because I started yeah. playing the video, maybe. Oh, maybe. Anyway, it was a scrappy goal. Okay. He hit it with his right foot, and Jose Sarr sort of fumbled it into his own net. Okay. Uh, One more. Okay, one more. One more. Uh, 10 out of 10 at Fox Spurs. That's the entire play rating. Um, well, I'm guessing it's against Spurs and I'm guessing... Who oh, fuck? I Spurs mean, away in January, I'd say. Every player? 
Ben White, William Sleeber, Gabriel Magalais, Alexander Zinchenko, Tom's Party, <laughs> Granit Xhaka, Martin Odegaard, Bukayo Saka, uh, Gabriel Martinelli, Eddie Nketia, Kieran Tierney, Takiro Tomiyasu, Emil smith and Fabio Vieira. Yeah. Yes. In Tottenham nil, Arsenal 2. Fox Which begs the what did you give Aaron Ramsdale that day? Does the system permit 11s? It must. What did I give Aaron Ramsdale that day? I can go back and look, actually. If he wasn't listed here. Maybe he's omitted from the answer. Maybe so. I should all go the back and look. players have been given 10. But I seem to remember he was our man of the match that day. I think so. Yeah, that was the one where the, the dude kicked him, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure he got a 10. Assaulted him. Um, oh, no. Hang on. I've got the... Yeah, here we go. I was in the wrong bit of the ratings. Oh, not the wrong bit. The wrong bit. Matches, come on. Uh, this thing can sometimes take a moment or two to load. 22, 23. We uh, need to know. We need to know. Um, boom, boom, boom. Spurs. Let me find it. Uh, what game of the season? There it is. Hang on, I've got it here. Uh, 10. And my remark on him was... I would give him 11 if I could. Right. So there the system go. doesn't permit it. Yeah. And our bonus rating that day was 10 out of 10. Aaron Ramsdale just laughing at Richarlison as he made that final clearance. The Spurs prick just couldn't take it. What a wanker. Love Ramsdale so much. Ah, uh, happier mm, times. Happier times for Usually all Usually the warm and fuzzy. I don't like these modern times where we don't win every game. Yeah. And, and Richarlison's allowed to score goals again. Yeah. Well... Listeners to the 30 will know that that's entirely Phil Costa's fault. I've seen Phil Costa yeah. taking a lot of flat for that, um, and rightly so. Yeah, if you want to find out why, join us later on on Patreon, um, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up with Phil. I think it's time. We've got to put an end to this Richarlison scoring goals business. Let's finish with this from Nick. It's not really a question. He says, magpies, all in yeah. caps. My friend told me about the magpies who converge on a nearby golf course and steal people's snacks when they're busy golfing. Recently, though, one magpie stole a bloke's baggie of weed. Fucking magpies. Wow. And I read that and it got me thinking. It got me thinking, like, do we need an update to the, the magpie jingle? What if the magpies were actually stoned and a bit psychedelic and what have you so go on this is kind of what i came up with magpies living in the garden stealing weed wearing tartan blazing up in the treetops what you gonna do call the cops wacky backy make your knees weak magpie stoner with his evil beak peck your eyes he's a lethal grizzler Kill your grand for some king size Rizzler. Make pies. I love it. <laughs> Stone. Off their tits. <laughs> a softer side to magpies. Yeah. More a more chilled out yeah. kind of malevolence to yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They're just sort of vibing in the trees, you know? Yeah, I'm into it. To be honest, I liked it. I do have uh, a magpie fact. Let's Louis. do it. Come on. Oh, it comes from the Daily Mail, so you know it's going to be good. Um, <laughs> so there are four things. So basically, an Australian schoolgirl aged eight has won an award for her global study revealing who magpies are most likely to target when they dive bomb. Oh, my God. Yes, she's in the third grade in Australia, I believe. She uh, assessed things according to people's height, weight, gender, and hairstyle. Now, <laughs> <laughs> so she apparently she's very passionate about mathematics and also interested in magpies. So this was a natural study topic mm. for her. So she asked all the participants how often they were dive bombed by magpies and cross-referenced their physical characteristics. Using those statistics, we should get Scott on here. This is proper data stuff now. Yeah. <laughs> she, she concluded 
<laughs> it's X- bad news for me, Andrew. X magpie. <laughs> this is bad news. The the humans most targeted by magpies tend to be tall, balding men who were <laughs> overweight or large in size. <laughs> I am prime target. Watch out. Yeah, so she found the number one target of her local park's bad magpie, who she dubbed Mr. Swoops a lot, um, <laughs> was epitomised by one particular participant, Mr. Q. He was male, tall, thin on top, short beard, solid, and was swooped constantly. What are they and looking at? What is the, What are they targeting here? It's the must shiny be the, head? Well, we know they like shiny things, Andrew. It's the That's reflective true. bonces. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got to grow my hair back or at least buy a wig. Or, you know, wear a hat of some description with some branding on it of some kind. I don't know. People who are six feet tall or taller were twice as likely to have been targeted than those under 160 centimetres. Right. It's, it's like they're trying to find me. It doesn't say anything about glasses. Thank God. Okay, good, good. I mean, they take um, those as well. They can be shiny. She wrote in her survey, my conclusion, Mr. swoops doesn't like tall, solid men with thin or receding hairstyles. He also doesn't like hats. Oh, okay. There's well, there's no yeah. escape. What wow. about helmets? Could you wear a helmet? I mean, it's a bit of an inconvenience going to the park wearing a helmet, though. Yeah, sure. A helmet with hair on it would be good. Yeah. I think Flight of the Concords have one of those, don't they? Do they? A helmet that they've, yeah, I think so, that they've sort of put hair on the outside so it just looks like a big hairdo. No one can tell you're wearing a helmet. Oh. <laughs> they found a way around this problem. Well, that's it. I mean, they've got the experience from being you know, down under where the magpies are, are more vicious, I think, than the ones in this part of the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, I say let the magpies steal more weed because it might sort of, temper mm. their wrath yes exactly exactly if they're sitting around wondering where they're going to get biscuits and some crisps and stuff they're not going to be busy swooping people you know yeah that's it yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it okay well look we better leave it there um for this particular show thank you as always for being with us like i said we'll talk about the premier league action this weekend half a half a weekend's action because um, half the teams have been off, including us. We'll do it over on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash arsblog. We will have something uh, for you midweek as well. We've got a waffle coming for you, so join us for that as well. That's a podcast in which James and I talk about anything and everything except Arsenal, which is, I guess, just another version of this Basically episode. this again, guys. Yeah. It's going to be similar. <laughs> yeah. So join us for that. In the meantime, take it easy, folks, and we'll catch you on the next one. Bye-bye. Uh, 